anyways. So, <clears throat> don't panic. The Comprehensive Ars Technica Guide to the Coronavirus. It's a fast and moving epidemic. We'll update this guide regularly, so feel free to uh, check in with this guide on your own time. If you're having any, uh, if you have any confusion about the virus or, you know, uh, procedures get updated. All right, let's get started. It's a pretty long article, so planning to get through it in the next, in this, in one sitting. <clears throat> More than 100,000 people have been infected with a new coronavirus that spread widely from its origin in China over the past few months. More than 3,000 have already died. Our comprehensive guide for understanding and navigating this global public health threat is below. This is a rapidly developing epidemic, and we will update this guide regularly to keep you as prepared and informed as possible. March 8th, initial publication of the documentation, so today. All right, table of contents, all the good stuff. How worried should I be? You should be concerned and take this seriously, but you shouldn't panic. I'll, I'll state that one more time because it's going to be a an important thing throughout all of this. You should be concerned and take this seriously, but you should not panic. This is the mantra public health experts have adopted since the epide epidemic mushroomed in January, and it's about as comforting as it is easy to accomplish. But it's important that we all try. This new coronavirus, dubbed SARS-CoV-2, uh, uh, is unquestionably dangerous. It causes disease. It causes a disease called COVID-19, which can be deadly, particularly for older people and those with underlying health conditions. While the death rate among infected people is unclear, even some current low estimates are sevenfold higher than the estimate for seasonal influenza. And SARS-CoV-2 is here in the U.S., and it's circulating. We're only starting to determine where it is and how far it's spread. Problems with federal testing have delayed our ability to detect infections in travelers. <clears throat> and as we work to catch up, the virus has kept moving. It now appears to be spreading in several communities across the country. It's unclear if we'll be able to get ahead uh, to get ahead of it and contain it. Even, even if we can, it will take a lot of resources and effort to do it. All that said, SARS-CoV-2 is not an existential threat. While it can be deadly, around 80% of cases are mild to moderate, and people recover within a week or two. Moreover, there are obvious, evidence-based actions we can take to protect ourselves, our loved ones, and our communities overall. Now is not the time for panic, which will only get in the way of what we need to be doing. While it's completely understandable to be worried, your best bet to getting through is it, through this unscathed is to channel that anxiety, anxious energy into doing what you can to stop SARS-CoV-2 from spreading. And to do that, you first need to have the most complete, accurate information on the situation as you can. To that end, below is our best attempt to address all the questions you might have about SARS-CoV-2, COVID-19, and the situation in the U.S. We'll start here, or we'll, we'll start with where all of this all of this starts, the virus itself. Oh yeah, I'm good. I'm just doing a PSA uh, for covid what is SARS-CoV-2? SARS-CoV-2 stands for Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome Contravirus 2. <clears throat> As the name suggests, oh, sorry, not Contravirus. I'm sorry if I make that mistake. For some reason, it, it gets mixed up in my head. Coronavirus 2. <laughs> As the name suggests, it is a coronavirus and is related to the coronavirus that causes SARS, Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome, Note, when SARS-CoV-2 was first identified, it was provisionally dubbed 2019 Novel Coronavirus, or 2019 NCOV. 
Coronaviruses are a large fam family of viruses that get their name from the halo of spiked proteins that, ad that adorn their outer surface, which resemble a crown, corona, under a microscope. As a family, they infect a wide range of animals, including humans. With the discovery of SARS-CoV-2, there are now seven types of coronaviruses known to infect humans. Four regularly circulate in humans and mostly cause mild to moderate upper respiratory tract infections, common colds essentially. The only, uh, the other three are coronaviruses that recently jumped from animal hosts to humans, resulting in more severe disease. These include SARS-CoV-2 as well as MERS-CoV, which causes middle, uh, which causes Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, MERS, and SARS-CoV, which causes, causes SARS. In all three cases, the viruses are thought to have moved from bats, which have a large number of coronavirus strains circulating, to humans via an intermediate animal host. Researchers have linked SARS-CoV to viruses in bats, which may have moved to humans through masked palm civets, and raccoon dogs sold for sold for food in live animal street markets in China. China. MERS is thought to have spread from bats to uh, dromedary camels before jumping jumping to humans. All right, good to know. Where uh, also uh, whoever's watching, if uh, let me know if the music is too distracting. I can always turn it off. I just figured it might help with the, you know processing. Where did SARS-CoV-2 come from? SARS-CoV-2 is related to coronaviruses in bats, but its intermediate animal host and route to humans are not yet are not yet clear. <clears throat> There's been plenty of speculation that the intermediate host could be pangolins, but that's not confirmed. How did it start infecting people? While the identity of SARS-CoV-2's intermediate host remains unknown, researchers suspect the mystery animal was present in a live animal market in Wuhan, China. Wuhan, China. The capital city of China's central uh, Hubei province and the epicenter of the outbreak. The market, which was later described in Chinese state media reports as filthy and messy, messy Filthy and messy. Sold a wide range of seafood and live animals, some wild. Many of the initial SARS-CoV-2 infections were linked to the market. In fact, many early cases were in people who worked there. Public health experts suspect that the untidiness of the market could have led to the virus's spread. Such markets are notorious for helping to launch new infectious diseases. They tend to cram humans together in a variety of, with a variety of live animals that have their own uh, menageries of pathogens. Close quarters, meat preparation, and poor hygienic conditions all offer viruses inordinate, an inordinate number of opportunities to recombine, mutate, and leap to new hosts, including humans. That said, a report in The Lancet described 41 early cases in the outbreak indicates that the earliest identified person sickened with SARS-CoV-2 has no links to the market. As ours, Ars Technica, <clears throat> has re reported before, the case was in a man whose infection began causing symptoms on December 1, 2019. None of the man's family became ill, and he had no ties to any of the other cases in the outbreak. The significance of this and the ultimate source of the outbreak remain unknown. The market was shut down and sanitized by Chinese officials on January 1st as the outbreak began to pick up. What happens when you're infected with SARS-CoV-2? In people, SARS-CoV-2 causes a disease dubbed COVID-19 by the World Health Organization, WHO. <clears throat> As the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, CDC, points out, 
Uh, the CO stands for Corona, VI for virus, and D for disease. What are the symptoms? COVID-19 is a disease with a range of symptoms and severities, and we're still learning about the full spectrum. So far, it seems to span from mild or potentially, um, uh, sorry, asmomatic, thank you, <laughs> uh, yeah, asymptomatic, sorry. <laughs> so far, it seems to span from mild or potentially asymptomatic cases all the way to moderate pneumonia, severe pneumonia, respiratory di distress, organ failure, and for some, death. Many cases start out with fever, fatigue, and mild respiratory symptoms like dry cough. Most cases don't get much worse, but some do progress into a serious illness. According to data from nearly 56,000 laboratory confirmed COVID-19 patients in China, the rundown of common symptoms went as followed. 88% had fever. 68% had a dry cough. 38% had fatigue, 33% coughed up phlegm, 19% had shortness of breath, 15% had joint or muscle pain, 14% had a sore throat, 14% had headache, 11% had chills, 5% had nausea or vomiting, 5% had nasal, nasal congestion, 4% had diarrhea, Less than 1% coughed up blood or blood-stained mucus. Less than 1% had watery eyes. All right. That data was published in a report by a band of international health experts assembled by the uh, World Health Organization and Chinese officials called the WHO China Joint Commission, who toured the country for a few weeks in February to assess the outbreak and response efforts. How severe is the infection? Most people infected will have a mild illness and recover completely in two weeks. In an epidemiological study of uh, 44,672 confirmed cases in China, offered by an, authored by an emergency response team of epidemi epidemiologists and published by the Chinese CDC, researchers reported that about 81% of cases were considered mild. The researchers defined mild cases as those ranging from the slightest symptoms to mild pneumonia. None of the mild cases were fatal, all were covered. Of the remaining cases in, in the study, about 14% were considered severe, which was defined as cases with difficult or labored breathing, an, increase, an increased rate of breathing, and in, and decreased blood oxygen levels. None of the severe cases were fatal. All were covered. Nearly 5% of cases were considered critical. These cases included respiratory failure, septic shock, and or multiple organ dysfunction or failure. About half of these patients died. Finally, 257 cases, that is 0.6%, lacked lacks severity data. The overall fatality rate in the patients examined was 2.3%. Uh, I'll state that again. The overall fatality rate in the patients examined was 2.3%. Who is most at risk of getting critically ill and dying? Your risk of becoming severely Ill, Ill and dying increases with age and underlying health conditions. In the group of 44,672 cases discussed above, the highest fatality rates were among those aged 60 and above. People aged 60 to 69 had a fatality rate of 3.6%. The 70 to 79 range <clears throat> age group had a fatality rate of about 8%, and those 80 or older had a fatality rate of nearly 15%. Additionally, the researchers had information about other health conditions for 20,812 of the 44,672 patients. 
of those with additional medical information available, 15,536 said they had no underlying health conditions. The fatality rate among that group was 0.9%, so slightly less than 1%. And there's a nice graph there of uh, COVID-19 cases and uh, deaths by age. All right. This is the interesting bit here, I think. Uh, let me turn on my cursor real quick because I have my capture software set to not have... The, uh-oh. What did I do? Oh, no. I turned it off. Come on now. Oh, I see what I did. Hold on. I'll be right back. There we go. Okay, so now I should have my cursor, right? Is it not working? No? Still not showing up? Okay, well, there it is. Okay, so this is the interesting area right here. Uh, as far as the data that we have right now, very, very young children, nine and under, uh, there haven't been any reported fatalities. Uh... So that's that's really good. Uh, yeah, very good thing. Uh, so that's very interesting. Either, yeah, I, I won't go into my own speculation. I'm just going to continue reading. But that's that's a very good thing to note, I think. <clears throat> the fatality rates were much higher among the remaining 5,200... 79 patients who reported some underlying health conditions those reported cardi those those who reported cardiovascular disease had a fatality rate of 10.5 percent for patients with diabetes the fatality rate was 7.3 percent patients with chronic respiratory disease had a rate of 6.3 percent patients with high blood pressure had a fatality rate of 6%, and cancer patients had a rate of 5.6%. Puzzlingly, men had a higher fatality rate than women. In the study, 2.8% of adult male patients died compared with 1.7% fatality rate among female patients. Are men more at risk? In multiple studies, researchers have noted higher case numbers in men than in women. The uh, World Health Organization Joint Mission report found that men made up 51% of cases. Another study of 1,099 patients found that men made up 58% of the cases. So far, it's unclear if these numbers are real or if they would even, or if they would even out if researchers looked at larger numbers of cases. It's also unclear if the bias may reflect difference, differences in exposure rates underlying health conditions, or smoking rates that may make men more susceptible. That said, sex differences have been seen in illnesses caused by SARS-CoV-2's relatives, SARS-CoV and MERS-CoV. There is some preliminary research looking into this, looking into this in mice. Some findings suggest that there may be a protective effect from the activity of the female hormone estrogen. Other research has also suggested that genes found on the X chromosome that are involved in modulating immune responses to viruses may also serve to better protect genetically female people who have two X chromosomes compared with genetic males who have only one X chromosome. Interesting. That's good to know. All this is, but that's interesting. Are children less at risk? Yes, it appears so. In all of the studies and data so far, children make up a tiny make up tiny fractions of the cases and <laughs> thank you for the for the host, I appreciate that. <clears throat> Alright. I'm gonna restart this. Are children at risk? Yes, it appears so. In all of the studies and data so far, children make up tiny fractions of the cases and have very few reported deaths. In the 44,672 cases examined by the Chinese CDC, less than 1% were children ages uh, 0 to 9 years old. 
None of those cases were fatal. Awesome. Similar findings have been reported in other, in other studies. The World Health Organization China Joint Mission Report also noted that children appear largely unscathed in this epidemic, writing, disease in children appears to be uh, relatively rare and mild. From the data so far, they report that infected children have largely been identified through contact tracing through contact tracing in households of adults. Okay. An unpublished, unpeer-reviewed study of 391 cases in Shenzhen, Shenzhen, China, seems to support that observation. It noted that within households, children appear just as likely to get infected as adults, but they had milder cases. The study has post, was posted on March 4th on a medical peer a preprint server. Still, as the joint mission report noted, given the data available, it is not possible to determine the extent of infection among children and what role that plays in driving the spread, uh, spread of disease and the epidemic overall. Of note, the report went on. Of note, the report went on. People interviewed by the joint mission team could not recall episodes in which transmission occurred from a child to an adult. How long does COVID-19 last? On average, it takes five to six days from the day you're infected with SARS-CoV-2 until you develop symptoms of COVID-19. This pre-symptomatic period, also known as incubation, can range from one to 14 days. From there, those with mild disease tend to recover in about two weeks, while those with more severe cases can take three to six weeks to recover, according to the World Health Organization Director, General Dr. Tidros uh, Adenom, oh my God, Gabriasis, Gabriasis. My apologies for mispronouncing your name, General. I, yeah, who goes by Dr. Tedros. Fine. Perfect. Uh, I'll repeat that little uh, part of, at the top again because I think it's pretty important. This pre-symptomatic period, also known as the incubation period, can range from 1 to 14 days. So, yeah, it's possible uh, if somebody has uh, COVID-19, they might not show symptoms for up to two weeks. How many people die from the infection? This is a difficult question to answer. The bottom line is that we don't really know. <clears throat> Case fatality rates, CFR, that is, that is the number of infected people who will die from the infection, are simply calculated by dividing the number of dead by the number of recovered plus, plus dead. The CFRs you've probably seen so far have likely been a crude version of this, deaths divided by total cases. One problem with these crude calculations is that the cases we're counting, is that the cases we are counting aren't all resolved. Some of the patients who are currently sick may later go on and die. In that situation, the patient's cases are counted, but their deaths are not yet. This skews the current calculation to make the CFR look artificially low. But a much larger concern is that we are undercounting uh, the number of cases overall, because most of the COVID-19 cases that we know about are mild. Health, ex health experts suspect that many more infected people have not presented themselves to healthcare providers to be tested. They may have mistaken their COVID-19 case for a common cold or didn't notice it at all. In areas hard hit by COVID-19, there may not have been enough testing capacity to detect all the mild cases. If a large number of mild cases are being missed in the total case count, it could make the CFR look artificially high. The best way to clear up this uncertainty is to wait until one of the local outbreaks is completely over and then do blood tests on the general population to see how many people were infected. Those blood tests would look for antibodies that target SARS-CoV-2. 
antibodies or Y-shaped proteins that immune systems make to help identify and attack pathogens and other unfriendly invaders. The presence of antibodies against a specific germ in a person's blood indicates the person has been exposed to that germ, either through infection or immunization. Screening the general population for SARS-CoV-2 antibodies will give a clearer picture of how many people were actually infected, regardless of whether they were symptomatic or diagnosed while sick. That number can then be used to calculate an accurate CFR. So far, some preliminary population screening for COVID-19 infections has been done in China, specifically in uh, Guangdong province. I think that's how it's pronounced. Specifically in Guangdong province. Screening of 320,000 people who went to a fever clinic suggested that we may be missing a vast number of mild cases. This in turn suggests the CFRs we are calculating now are wildly higher than they should be. However, <clears throat> experts still suspect that many mild cases are going under unreported and may still anticipate that the true CFR will be lower than what we're, what we're calculating now. Beyond getting the basic number of cases and deaths right, CFRs are also tricky because they can vary by population, time, and place. We've already noted above that the CFR increase in patients and patient populations based on age, gender, and underlying health. But as time goes on, healthcare providers will get collectively better at identifying and treat treating patients, thereby lowering the CFR. Complicating these statistics further, the quality of healthcare differs from place to place. The CFR in a resource-poor hospital may be higher than that in a resource-rich hospital. Additionally, health systems overwhelmed in an outbreak may not be able to provide optimal care for every patient, art artificially increasing the CFR in those places. This seems to be what we've seen in China so far. In the World Health Organization China Joint, Com Joint Mission Report, the experts noted that in Wuhan, where the outbreak began and where the health systems have been crushed by the number of cases, the CFR was a whopping 5.8%. The rest of China at the time had a CFR of only 0.7%. As of March 5th, there were about 13,000 cases and 400 deaths reported outside of China's Hubei province, where Wuhan is located. <clears throat> a crude calculation puts the CFR around 3%, but this calculation will likely drift throughout the outbreak. We will update the current crude CFR periodically. <clears throat> How does COVID-19 COVID compare with seasonal flu in terms of symptoms and deaths? Most cases of COVID-19 are mild and may feel similar to the seasonal flu before a person recovers. Though the case fatality rate is not yet clear for COVID-19, as noted above, it so far appears to be significantly higher than the CFR is seen from seasonal flu in the U.S. Overall, <clears throat> overall CFRs for COVID-19 have hovered around 2% to 3% during the outbreak. As reported by Kaiser Health News, uh, Christopher Moores, a global health professor at George Washington University, calculated the average 10-year mortality rate for flu in the U.S., at 0.1% based on the CDC data. Many experts use this figure, including Dr. Anthony Fauci, I, I think that's how you say it, a director of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Disease at the National Institutes of Health. Likewise, WHO Director General uh, Tedros noted in a recent statement that seasonal flu generally kills far fewer than 1% of those infected. Still, a lower CFR doesn't mean a low death toll. So far this flu season, the CDC estimates that up to 45 million Americans have been infected. 
hospitalizing up to uh, 560,000 and killing 46,000. Influenza is a leading cause of death in the U.S. This one, I am going to send this link once more to somebody else who's asking for it. And just take a second. Uh, one moment. Thank you for your patience. Thank you for your patience. I appreciate it. How does SARS-CoV-2 spread? SARS-CoV-2 spreads mainly in respiratory droplets, tiny germs, uh, tiny germ totting globes, globs, I'm sorry, tiny germ totting globs that are launched from the mouth or nose when you breathe heavily, talk, cough, or sneeze. Respiratory. Published data suggests that a single sneeze can unleash 40,000 droplets between 0.5 to 12 micrometers in diameter. Once airborne, these fall rapidly, rapidly onto the ground and typically don't land more than one meter away. SARS-CoV-2 does not linger in the air. If any droplets containing SARS-CoV-2 land on a nearby person and gain access to the eyes, nose, or mouth, or are delivered there by a germy hand, that person can get infected. If droplets containing SARS-CoV-2 land on surfaces, they can get picked up by others who can then uh, contract, uh, yeah, contract the infection. According to epidemiologist Maria Van Kerkhoff, an outbreak expert on the, at the World Health Organization, SARS-CoV-2 appears to be like its relative, SARS-CoV and that surface con contamination does seem to play a role in the epidemic. It's unclear how long SARS-CoV-2 can survive on, the, on a surface. A recent review published in the Journal of Hospital Infection suggests that human infection, uh, human infecting contraviruses, sorry, human infecting coronaviruses in general may be able to survive on surfaces for up to nine days. Sanitize your stuff. Uh, anyway. For now, the World Health Organization says SARS-CoV-2 may survive on surfaces for anywhere from a few hours to several days. The, the organization notes that survival will depend on environmental factors such as temperature, humidity, and the type of surface. That said, as Dr. Van Kirkhove noted, SARS-CoV-2 is quickly killed by disinfecting agents. As the review of coronavirus surface survival reported, the viruses are uh, efficiently inactivated by surface disinfection procedures with 62 to 71% ethanol. So, nice high percent alcohol. 0.5% uh, <clears throat> hydrogen peroxide, or 0.1% sodium uh, hypochloride bleach within one minute. All right. Last, genetic material from SARS-CoV-2 does seem to be shed in some, pa uh, in some patient species, potentially in up to 30% of patients, according to the report by the World Health or Organization China Joint Mission. A recent study in JAMA just found the virus lurking in toilet bowl and bathroom sink samples. However, as the joint mission report states, the fecal oral route does not appear to be a driver for COVID-19 transmission. Good to know. Moreover, uh, routine bathroom cleaning uh, efficiency Routine bathroom cleaning efficiently eliminated the infectious threat, the authors of the JAMA JAMA article concluded. How does coronavirus trans transmission compare with flu? <clears throat> In a press briefing on March 3rd, uh, World Health Organization 
Director General Dr. Tedros emphasized that this, this virus is not SARS, it is not MERS, and it's not influenza. It's a unique virus with unique characteristics. Both, corona, uh, both COVID-19 and influenza cause respiratory disease and spread the same way via small droplets of fluid from the nose and mouth of someone who is sick, he said. However, COVID-19 does not transmit as efficiently as influenza from the data we have so far. With influenza, people who are infected but not yet sick are major drivers of transmission, which does not appear to be the case for COVID-19. While media, re while media reports have wild wildly circular, goodness, I gotta take a drink of water, I'm getting tongue-tied. While COVID-19, well, sorry, while media reports have wildly circulated fears that asymptomatic people are silently spreading COVID-19 around communities and countries, there is little data to back that up. There is little data to back that up. In fact, asymptomatic cases appear rare and potentially misclassified. While media reports have wildly, oh, I'm reading the same thing again, aren't I? Dr. Tedros noted that only 1% of cases in China are reported as asymptomatic. And of that 1%, 75% do go on to develop symptoms. For COVID-19, the data indicates that people coughing and sneezing are the biggest drivers of the spread of SARS-CoV-2. Moreover, the th uh, thrust of the epidemic in China has been from the spread of this virus through household and close contact not unconnected community members. How likely am I get to get it in normal life? Your risk, your risk of exposure depends on where you live and where, you're re where you've recently traveled. In the U.S., the virus is spreading in certain communities, but it's not, not, to be, but it's not thought to be circulating wi widely. According to the CDC, Unless there have been a number of cases reported in your area, your risk is considered low. That said, with more testing happening, more cases will appear daily. There are basic things you can do to protect yourself and prepare for cases in your area. <clears throat> Alright, really important section. All personal stuff that you can do. <clears throat> what can I do to prevent spread and protect myself? The most important things you can do to protect yourself from COVID-19, as well as seasonal respiratory infections like flu and cold, is to practice good basic hygiene. That is, wash your hands frequently and thoroughly. Make sure to wash your hands with soap and water for 20 seconds, the time it takes you to hum the happy birthday song twice. One clever, tw uh, one <laughs> in parentheses, one cl clever Twitter user came up with some alternative tunes uh, for your mitt scrubbing, scrubbing pleasure, which uh, I'll have to check out later. You should especially wash your hands before eating, after using the restroom, sneezing, coughing, or blowing your nose. If you can't get to a sink, use, use a hand sanitizer that has at least 60% alcohol, the CDC says. Avoid touching your face, particularly your eyes, nose, and mouth. If you cough or sneeze, cover your face with your elbow or a tissue. If you use a tissue, throw that tissue away promptly. Then go wash your hands. Avoid close contact with sick people. If you think somebody has a respiratory infection, it's safest to stay two meters away. If you are sick, try to stay home and get better and avoid spreading the infection. Regularly disinfect commonly touched surfaces and items in your house, such as doorknobs and countertops. A little nice visual example here. Wash your hands with water. Apply enough soap to cover all hand surfaces. Rub your, rub your hands palm to palm. Right palm over left. Dorsum with interlaced fingers and vice versa. Palm to palm with fingers interlaced backs of fingers and opposing palms with fingers interlocked, rotational rubbing for 
uh, left thumb clasped and right palm and vice versa. Rotational rubbing backwards and forwards with clasped fingers in, uh, of right hand and left palm and vice versa. Rinse hands with water. Dry thoroughly with a single use towel. Use the towel to turn off the faucet and your hands are safe. The World Health Organization recommended method for hand washing. Should I get a flu vaccine? Capital, yes. Getting the flu vaccine will protect you from season the seasonal influenza and help prevent you from spreading that virus. Though the vaccine is not 100% effective, if you still get sick with the flu after you've been vaccinated, your illness will be milder than you than if you did not get vaccinated. Getting a flu vaccine is something you could do every year to protect yourself and your community, including those vulnerable to the infection and who cannot get vaccinated for medical reasons. But amid the COVID-19 epidemic, getting flu shot, getting a flu shot is even more important. COVID-19 can resemble the symptoms of influenza. If people are vaccinated against the flu and there are few cases of flu in the area, it may make spotting the new COVID-19 cases easier. Moreover, healthcare systems around the country are already stretched thin by flu patients who need care and hospitalization each season. In this flu, in this flu season so far, the CDC estimates that flu is responsible for up to 21 million medical visits and 560,000 hospitalizations. Fewer flu patients means more healthcare resources can be directed to detect and treat COVID-19 cases and thwart, and thwart the epidemic. So not just for yourself, but for your community. Get your flu shot if you can. <clears throat> when, if ever, should I buy or use a face mask? Here's one. Yeah, this is going to be a good section because there's uh, been a good bit of misinformation on this. If you're not sick, do not buy a face mask. If you have one already and you're well, it is not recommended that you use it. Face masks are now in short supply globally and prices have surged. This is making it difficult for healthcare workers to get the supplies they need to keep themselves safe and they can stay so they can stay healthy, keep treating patients, and avoid spreading the infection. This tragic situation is exacerbating the outbreak. So people buying masks in, pa in a panic and wearing them when they're not sick, it, it's making it worse. In a March 3 plea, the World Health Organization called on industry and governments to step up production of masks and help thwart inappropriate buying. The World Health Organization has warned that severe and mounting disruption of the global supply of personal protective equipment, PPE, caused by rising demand, panic buying, hoarding, and misuse, is putting lives at risk from the new coronavirus and other infectious diseases, the agency said in a statement. We can't stop COVID-19 without protecting health workers first. Very good point. The World, World Health Organization Director General Dr. Uh, Tedros said, In addition to putting health care workers at risk, wearing a mask may also put you at risk. For one thing, face masks are not entirely effective. Masks still leave your eyes exposed. If rubbed with germy hands, they can be an entry point for viruses. Surgical masks are loose-fitting and leave open the possibility of infectious particles working their way around working their way around the mouth. Even the use of N95 respirators, which are designed to protect against respiratory droplets, may not be that helpful, helpful to you, since they require proper fitting and many people do not wear them correctly or consistently. Some experts suggest that when members of the public wear face masks, they tend to fuss with them and touch their faces more. This increase, this increases the risk of transferring pathogens from hands to entry points. Also, if you touch the outside surface of a contaminated face mask, you can then contaminate, contaminate your hand 
and go on to infect yourself. This negates the purpose of wearing a face mask. Last, some health experts worry that wearing a face mask may give the people uh, may give people a false sense of security, potentially making them lax about other precautions and protections. The only time experts recommend that members I'm, the very important part here. The only time experts recommend that members of the public wear a mask is if they are carry is if they are caring for a sick person or are already sick and showing signs of COVID-19. In that case, wearing a mask could reduce the risk that you will, will spread the infection to others. So only if you're caring for someone who's sick or if you're sick yourself, that's when you should wear a face mask. <clears throat> Otherwise, masks should be reserved for healthcare workers. Should I avoid large gatherings and travel? Unfortunately, there is no clear or general answer to this. Like your risk of exposure generally, risk from attending events and traveling depends on where you are and where you're going. Anytime you're faced with such a decision amid this epidemic, you should consider not only your local risk, but also whether you will encounter people from high-risk areas while traveling to the event or once you're at it. For local events largely attended by local people and communities well, there, where there are no or limited cases, attending is considered low risk. Traveling to or through areas experience, experiencing large clusters of cases will certainly increase your, your risk of contracting COVID-19. Attending a conference where there will be groups of people from high-risk areas also increases your risk. But of course, these risks assessments only hold up if we have a firm grasp on where the virus is circulating. Right now, we're not in a good place to assess this, according to Harvard epidemiology professor Mark, Lips Mark uh, Lipsitch. <clears throat> a month ago, it was easier to answer, and I think a month from now, it will be easier to answer. Lipschitz said in a COVID-19 forum at Harvard on March 2nd, right now it's possibly the hardest time to answer. Fair enough. Earlier, the outbreak was mostly in China's Hubei province, so it was easy to recommend travel restrictions to and from there. And a month from now, the virus may be so widespread that traveling doesn't change your risk much. Or it could be uh, contained and it will be clear which places are low or high risk, we can hope. But for now, the virus is scattered around the globe. It's hard to pin down which places are low and high risk. With new cases popping up continually, the situation in any given place can change at a dizzying pace. The United States hasn't tested enough to know uh, whether we're high, medium, or low, or a low-risk place, Lipschitz said. Uh, <clears throat> we're probably not high, but we're probably, but we probably could be medium, he said. This means that people will have to make their own assessments thinking about the possible exposures they might have. I think it's really hard, he concluded. For anyone facing criticism of being too cautious, Lipschitz said, Lipschitz did say that limine, limiting uh, optional travel makes it a lot, makes a lot of sense, high risk or not. It's part of a response to try to slow this down. Fair enough. For places with known risk, the CDC provides risk assessments and travel guidance on its website. Here, there's a link there. What precautions should I, should I take if I travel? If you must travel, avoid contact with sick people, wash your hands frequently, use hand sanitizer, and avoid touching your face. If you're traveling by air, avoid layovers and high-risk areas. How should I prepare for the worst case scenario? <clears throat> this epidemic is unpredictable, and it is possible that it could begin spreading in your community. That might lead 
to problems in the supply chain for various foods and goods, such as masks. It might also mean that local authorities will recommend social distancing measures, asking you to spend more time at home as events and gatherings get canceled. Schools may close down for periods of time to, to, stop, disease, to stop disease spread. Employers may recommend working from home when possible, and healthcare providers may push the use of telehealth services. In the event you get sick with COVID-19, you'll likely face a two-week isolation period at home, unless your illness becomes severe and you, and you require medical care at a hospital. Experts suggest that you haven't, that if you haven't already, go ahead and start putting together an emergency stash of food and supplies for these scenarios, but do not panic and buy, but do not panic buy, sorry, but do not panic buy and do not hoard. Just pick up a few extra items on your routine shopping trips that will help make sure you don't run out of food if you're stuck in your house for two weeks. Fair enough. <clears throat> Stick with shelf-stable items that you'll use regardless of how this epidemic plays out. Things like dried pasta, canned foods, beans, lentils, peanut butter, trail mix, nuts, shelf-stable or powdered milk, coffee, mm, cereal, cooking oil, and other grains. Since it's unlikely that we'll lose power or municipal water, it's probably safe to stock up on some frozen items you normally eat, and you can skip buying a lot of bottled water. In addition to food, you should think about having some extra supplies of home goods and medicines on, on hand. If you take prescription medications, try to have extra doses, though this can be difficult to do. Keep your home comfortably stocked with things like toilet paper, tissues, diapers, soap, cleaning products and sanitizers, cleaning products and sanitizers, pet foods, and feminine products. Again, don't hoard. Just buy a bit extra in case you need to skip a routine shopping trip or two. If things, if things look like they're going to get generally bad in terms of supply chain issues, you can dash out in the 11th hour to pick up whatever dairy, whatever dairy produce, meat, or baked goods you can get. The CDC has, deta has a detailed list of other items to keep on hand in general emergencies. Should I keep anything in my medicine cabinet for COVID-19? <clears throat> With most mild to moderate cases involving nonspecific flu-like symptoms, you may want to make sure you have enough fever reducer, pain reliever, such as ibuprofen or acetaminophen. You might also want to consider keeping over-the-counter treatments of cold uh, over-the-counter treatments of colds around just because it's that season. Upper respiratory symptoms like productive hmm, productive coughs and nasal congestion were not common system. Sorry, I'm going to read that again. <laughs> Upper respiratory symptoms like productive coughs and nasal congestion were not common symptoms of COVID-19, but they are sometimes present. Otherwise, there aren't specific treatments. Should I go to a doctor if I think I have COVID-19? If you believe you have COVID-19, the CDC advises you to call your, in bold letters, to call your health care provider. Do not make an unannounced office visit. Your health care provider with the help of your state's health department and the CDC can determine if you should come in, in and get tested. Obvious reasons to test include the presence of COVID-19 like, like symptoms, having had contact with someone known to be infected, living in a place where transmission is occurring, or if you've recently traveled to a place where transmission is occurring. If you do have COVID-19, Getting tested can help with local health departments. Uh, can help local health departments track the virus's spread, and identify contact and identify contacts who may have also been exposed. Once your case is confirmed, your healthcare provider and local health department 
can work with you to monitor and manage your health and assess when you're no longer at risk of spreading the infection. But it's important that you call ahead before going to a healthcare provider if you're concerned you have COVID-19. This will help determine if you can and should be tested and provide your healthcare provider with a chance to prepare the office so you'll not potentially expose people in the facility or patients in the waiting room to the virus. So yeah, no unannounced visits because you could end up spreading the infection to other patients. <clears throat> if a healthcare provider has you come in for a test, the CDC recommends wearing a mask and as always, practicing good hygiene. So presumably, presumably, presumably the uh, healthcare provider would uh, do something like maybe meet you outside, provide you with a mask, then you come in, something like that. When should I seek emergency care? If, you've, if you have a confirmed case of COVID-19, or if you have a suspected case and your condition worsens and you have trouble breathing, call your doctor immediately to seek prompt medical care. If your condition becomes an emergency, call 911 and inform them that you may have COVID-19. Wear a mask if possible when emergency responders arrive. That's an interesting part there. You know, in certain cases, it is recommended to wear masks, but they're also just suggesting you don't buy the masks. Hmm. So that's something you could all, if you do have to, you know, call a responder, you could be like, I don't have a mask. Uh, maybe they could leave one at your doorstep or something and you could grab it and put it on. I, I don't know, but yeah. Is the U.S. healthcare system ready for this? As experts at the World Health Organization have repeatedly warned, COVID-19 can put enormous strain on healthcare systems. For weeks, they've been advising for countries to get ready and have a plan. So far, there have been worrying signs that the U.S. healthcare system has not heeded this warning. Last week, news broke of a whistleblower allegation that the Department of Health and Human Services sent dozens of untrained employees without protective gear to help manage <clears throat> to help manage repatriated citizens at high risk of COVID-19 and under quarantine. On March 5th, the New York the New York Times reported that nurses in Washington and California where SARS-CoV-2 is circulating in some communities have had to beg for masks and have been pulled from quarantines to treat patients. In a survey of more than 6,500 6, nurses in 48 states by National Nurses United, a nationwide union of nurses, only 29% of reported, only 29% reported that their hospitals had plans in place to isolate possible COVID-19 cases. Only 44% said their employees had provided them with guidance on how to respond to, pot to potential COVID-19 cases, and only 63% said they had access to N95 respirators. <clears throat> there have also been anecdotal reports from Washington and California of people trying to get tested for the virus, but being told that there were no tests available. What are the problems with testing in the U.S.? Testing for COVID-19 in the U.S. has been a tragic debacle. The CDC was tasked with coming up with a diagnostic test to detect SARS-CoV-2 in respiratory samples from patients. The, the agency developed an RT-PCR test for the new virus and sent testing kits beginning in early February to states. But, as the agency notes on its website, Shortly thereafter, performance issues were identified related to, the, to a problem in the manufacturing of one of the reagents, which led to laboratories not being able to verify the test performance. Ugh. While the CDC has been mum about what, exact, what exactly went wrong, a report in Science, the 
yeah, science, capital S, suggested that the problem was with a negative control in the kit. The problem was with a negative tr control in the kit. A sample designed to produce a negative test result. <clears throat> Should that control return a positive result, it would render the test result uh, uninterpretable. Since there's no way of knowing if positive results are actually due to the presence of the virus. All right. A report in Axios suggests that the problem may have been due to contamination. The problem took the agency weeks to resolve, and many states weren't able to ramp up the testing, ramp up testing until the end of February and the start of March. This has not gone as smoothly as we would have liked. Dr. Nancy uh, Maisonier, I guess, yeah. Nancy Maisonier, director of the CDC's National Center of Immunization and, Refs and Respiratory Diseases, said in a press briefing on February 28th. The testing snag cost the country precious time and in, in detecting imported cases isolating them, and tracking their con contacts. Critical steps needed to contain the virus. Now in early March, things are improving. The CDC has worked out the problem with its tests. The FDA has loosened regulations on who can design their own tests, and commercial tests are coming online and provide additional kits uh, to provide additional kits to states. Unsurprisingly, in the first few days of increased testing capacity, the number of confirmed cases in the U.S. exploded. As of March 5th, there were more than 300 cases nationwide and 17 deaths. As of today, th that number is over 550. Right? Yeah. Hold on, it sounds like I'm about to get a knock. Uh, Sean brought me dinner. The sweetheart. All right. Mm. Just one mo moment. Mm. What a sweetheart. Okay. Back to the books. Where was I? Oh. Yep. Okay. What could happen if healthcare facilities become overwhelmed? If the situation in the U.S. in certain communities gets out of hand, and it's not all clear if this will happen, hospitals and healthcare facilities may be able to handle the number of COVID-19 patients seeking care. Or, sorry, I need to read that again because I left out an important word. May not be able to handle the number of COVID-19 patients seeking care. I'll just read the whole thing. If the situation in the U.S. or in certain communities gets out of hand, and it's not at all clear if this will happen, mind you, hospitals and healthcare facilities may not be able to handle the number of COVID-19 patients seeking care. This could lead to, to suboptimal care for those patients, potentially increasing the case fatality rate in the country. If healthcare systems are overwhelmed, the severe and critical cases will likely get priority, potentially allowing mild cases to go undetected and untreated. This could in turn allow the virus to keep spreading. Again, it's unclear if this will happen. It is a, it is a worst case scenario that can in part be avoided if individuals do their part to stop the spread of the disease with hygiene recommendations and mitigation efforts such as social distancing. When will all of this be over in the U.S.? No one knows. Such epidemics are extremely unpredictable. But experts expect that COVID-19 will be with us for at least the coming weeks and months. Will SARS-CoV-2 die down in the summer? So far, we have no evidence that SARS-CoV-2 will be stifled by warming temperatures. World Health Organization epidemiologist Maria 
Van Kirkhove says, It's unclear exactly why influenza and other respiratory viruses tend to peak in colder months. Some evidence suggests that the lower temperatures and lower humidity may help viruses spread, but we don't know if that's true for this coronavirus. We don't know if that's true for this one. Will it become a seasonal infection? This is also unknown, but some epidemiology, uh, epidemiologists, including Harvard's Mark Lips, uh, Lipsitch, suggest that SARS-CoV-2 could be with us indefinitely and that we will eventually see it return in seasonal waves. What about treatment and vaccines? And there's our author, Beth Mull. What about seasonal treatments and vaccines? Since the epidemic began in January, researchers have rushed to start clinical trials and begun developing vaccine candidates. There are now dozens of vaccine efforts underway. The National Institute of Allergy and Infectious, Infectious Disease at the National Institute of Health has partnered with uh, biotechnology company Moderna to test vaccine and ca vaccine candidate, sorry, to test a vaccine candidate based on messenger RNA that will cause an individual cells to produce a viral protein without an infection. An early clinical trial in, in people is expected to start in the coming weeks. If it is successful, a usable vaccine will still take at least a year and a half, according to the NIAD's director, Dr. Fauci. And that is very a very optimistic estimate. So, yeah, no, no commercially available cure uh, anytime soon. Meanwhile, researchers and biotech companies are also working on treatments for COVID-19. On February 25th, the NIH announced that a clinical trial has begun to test whether an experimental antiviral drug called uh, remdesivir, remdesivir can help COVID-19 patients hospitalized in Nebraska Medical Center, UNMC, in, in Omaha. All right. Researchers are also working on plasma-derived treatments, which have some positive anecdotal reports. The basic idea behind plasma, ther plasma therapy is to harvest antibodies against SARS-CoV-2 from the blood plasma of infected patients after they recovered. Those collected antibodies can then be injected into newly infected patients, where they could bolster immune responses, potentially improving outcomes and shortening recovery times. On March 4th, uh, Takeda Pharmaceuticals uh, pharmaceutical company announced that it is beginning work on a plasma derived therapy for COVID-19. All right. So this story will, this not story, this information will, uh, continue to be updated as more information comes out. Uh, so yeah, uh, keep yourself informed. Uh, this is the best I can do to get the information out at the moment. And all, all these, you know, all things are linked uh, to either scientific reporting or uh, whatever other relevant information. Uh, Ars Technica is generally very, very good about uh, citing their sources. So, <clears throat> all right. Well, to end on a uh, less dreary note, I do kind of want to see what this uh, person's alternate to the happy birthday song is. Alternative tunes. Meh. You're supposed to wash your hands for 20 seconds, which is the time it takes you to sing happy birthday twice. But I'm tired of singing happy birthday, and you probably are too. So I've done the very public, very important public service of compiling other songs with rough, roughly 20 second choruses to sing. Oh, where are they? Oh my gosh. <laughs> All right, Beyonce. Love on Top, Fleetwood Mac, Landslide, Prince, Raspberry Beret, Dolly Parton, Jolene, Toto, Africa, ah, oh, so good, okay, 
I'm going to be singing Africa in the bathroom. Again. Lizzo, truth hurts. All right, so there are some suggestions for your hand washing. All right, that's all I got for today. I hope this has helped uh, maybe clear up some uh, conflicting information you might have had about the virus and about uh, measures that you can personally take to protect yourself and protect those around you. Thank you guys for listening in and watching and stay safe. Uh, we'll all get through this. Uh, it's, it's gonna, it's gonna take a, take all of us too. So yeah, be safe and yeah, have a good one. Okay. All right. Bye.